Okay, guys, last part. We are on part 34 of our book, Posted, and it's our very last one. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the book. This is part 34, and we are on page 358. She handed over a fish folded from an old math quiz that she'd aced. She was incredibly smart, Rose Holland, a total nerd, pure tapioca, and she ate deadly tree-studded kamikaze hills for breakfast. She was frankly kind of awesome, and I was a little surprised she still bothered to hang out with us. What is it this time, I asked, taking the paper fish from her, knowing Rose it could be anything. She shrugged. That's the best part, she said, smiling. Hey, we're still on for this weekend, right? Dee Dee asked. I mean, I've got all new maps and everything. Absolutely, Rose said. Then she pointed to his tray and asked if she could have the rest of his pudding. There had been a rebellion. At least that's how Dee Dee put it. Of course, he was prone to exaggeration, but in this case, we cut him some slack. He was the master after all. He had done all the prep work. We were just along for the ride. The goblins are revolting, he said in a comically deep voice that wasn't supposed to be funny at all. They have risen up against their masters and are now planning a takeover of the entire kingdom, the world of men, he looked across the table, and women included. Viva la revolucion, I said, refusing to pass up a chance to tease the dungeon master about his limited Spanish. Charlene doesn't do goblins, Rose tested, protested, twisting his, her little cardboard gnome around and around. We were all sitting at my scratched up dining room table. Rose looked a little scrunched in one corner, but it didn't seem to bother her. She considers them beneath her. Swords don't discriminate, Dee Dee told her. Mine does, she said. I find that hard to believe, Wolf said. Rose looked at Wolf and smiled. She reached for the bowl of chips, sour cream and onion, but he snatched it away from her. Not until you promise to play fair, he said. No making up random powers that you don't have and no bullying Dee Dee into letting you re-roll your dice just because you feel like it. You're such a downer, Rose teased. Since when does Wolf Thompson play by the rules? It's the school uniform, I said. Wearing khaki all day makes you tame. Lay off the khaki, Wolf warned. I happen to look very good in slacks and polos. Besides, on Fridays, we get to wear jeans. You rebel, Rose snarked. We joked about Wolf's new posh private school, but truthfully, he seemed happy there, and the rest of us were just jealous that it had an open campus, and we still had to eat lunch in our obnoxious and odd-furious od cafeteria. Are we going to get started or what? Dee Dee was getting impatient. I nodded, poured us all a round of red cream soda, which had become the only beverages served in taverns across the five realms. Our little table was crowded with all of Dee Dee's maps and guides and his towers of dice and the chips and our cups. We started switching houses every week, and it was my turn to host. Kind of a shame, because Rose had a gigantic basement with an expensive-looking poker table that was perfect for dra dragon slaying, plus a gargantuan TV and a fridge full of soda in the garage. I lobbied to move D&D &D night to her house permanently, but she said her parents would never go for it. Her mom wasn't much of a people person and didn't like loud noises, and even from all the way in the basement, she could hear Dee Dee's groans whenever we set one of his minions on fire. Noise wasn't an issue with my mother. That's another thing that made her cool. There were a lot of things, actually. She was in the kitchen, only one room away, watching the oven, determined not to burn the homemade chocolate chip cookies and singing Janice Joplin so loud I almost didn't hear the doorbell ring. Did you order pizza? Dee Dee asked hopeful. I shook my head and got out of my seat. The three of us, the three of them following me to the door, probably because they thought I was lying. Outside the living room window, you could see the first brent and snow starting to fall, a crystalline blanket, the color and consistency of soft wool. I saw the car parked in our driveway, headlights on, still running. I recognized it instantly and my stomach lurched as I opened the door. Hey, Frost. Bench stood there in his BMS jacket, a cap pulled down to his eyebrows. He had his hands tucked in his pockets. Hey, guys, Dee Dee said hi back. Wolf and Rose just waved. I glanced nervously behind me toward the dining room to see if they he, that you could spot the table from the doorway with all the dice and figures spread across it. I wondered who told him we were getting together at my place tonight, but then I saw the look on Dee Dee's face and it was obvious. What's up? I asked. I know you guys are busy. Bench scratched his head underneath the rim of his cap. He did this when he was nervous. I actually just came by to tell you that the last football game of the season is next week, he continued. 
We're only four and six, but I know you're not really all into it, but Coach says I'll probably get to start this time. His voice trailed off. Oh, I said that's great. I meant it. It really was great. Bench wasn't going to be bench anymore. I'd have to find something else to call him, at least during football season. Yeah, so, you know, it, it'd be kind of cool if you could come. He was looking at all of us, not just me. Sure, I said, though I wasn't sure at all. Bench focused on Wolf standing in the doorway behind him. How's the new school? Good? Yeah, it's good, Wolf said. Things are all right. Bench nodded. I couldn't be sure, but I thought he looked relieved, like that was really the reason he stopped by, to ask that question and get that answer. The rest was just an excuse. He glanced back at his car where his dad was waiting for him. Okay, then, I guess I'll see you around. He was halfway down the sidewalk when Rose called out to him, Bench, hold up! She stepped beside, ignoring the snow that slushed beneath her feet, seeping into her purple socks. You could see her cloudy breath and Bench's meeting in the cold as they faced each other. I don't know what you got going on, she said, but we haven't started playing yet, and judging by the number of manuals Dee Dee brought, it's going to be epic. That is, if it's all right with everyone else, she turned and looked in the doorway. Dee Dee and I both looked at Wolf. It was my house. Rose's offers... Well, Rose's offer, Dee Dee's game, but we let Wolf make the call. After everything that had happened, it only seemed right. Wolf shoved his own hands in his pockets, the cold air already pinking up his freckled cheeks. I think we can make room, he said. And for a moment, I pictured it. All five of us crammed around the table somehow, laughing and teasing and carrying on, snorting red pop and begging my mother for more cookies. But I'm a sucker for a good image. I knew Bench's answer already, even before Rose asked. Thanks. Maybe next time. Bench smiled, then walked to the edge of the driveway, put his hand on the car door, and stopped. In the amber glow of our porch light, he looked older to me, a high school kid already, even though high school was still half a year and forever away. No matter what happens, he said, keep your head up, keep your eyes forward, and don't let go, Rose finished. Bench nodded and got into his car. His father waved as he pulled away. The four of us stood in the doorway with Rose at the front of our pack and watched, and I realized that from here on out, it would always be maybe next time. Maybe we'd all go see him in his last middle school football game. Maybe only some of us would. Maybe just one. Maybe there'd be summer days where we'd happen to meet up at Freedom Park and kick the ball around, his ball this time. Or just sit in the grass and talk about nothing in particular, favorite bands, lame movies, the usual. But it would never be just like it was before. Two roads and so on. I couldn't predict the future any more than Dee Dee's dice could. All I knew for sure was that it was cold outside and the goblins were coming and the villagers were coming on a backstabbing thief, a passionate bard, a ninja warrior princess named Moose to come and save them. Which... We were going to do whether Charlene, the freaking crazy sharp sword that will cut your head off if you make fun of her, wanted to or not. And we would easily polish off both bottles of soda and all the chocolate chip cookies. Then we would squeeze onto the couch afterward with a big bag of cheese turds and settle in for a couple more episodes of Doctor Who. Just enough room for the four of us, shoulder to shoulder, packed tighter than the trees and on Hirohito, Hirohito Hill, telling each other that everything was going to be all right without even saying a word. <gasps> and we're finished. Okay, head over to Schoology.